It's hard to believe now, but this two-ton beauty may have been America's first muscle car. Ah, the 50s. Bobby socks, rock and roll, ducktail haircuts, and big, powerful land yachts like this one, the Chrysler 300. They called them the letter cars because each year from 1955 through 1965, each new model was designated by a letter of the alphabet tacked onto the end of its name. The 1955 Chrysler 300 evolved into the 300B for 1956, and so on. Each one represented the peak of Chrysler's styling and the best of its engineering. After 1965, Chrysler took a break from making letter cars. And except for a few special editions, like this 1969 300 Hearst, the 300 concept stayed in the closet. Until 1999, when it came roaring back as the magnificent 300M. Today's 300 letter car is as forward looking as the ones from the 50s and 60s. It's made for a different world, but it's made for the same kind of car buyer that jumped all over that first one back in 1955. For people who love to drive, the renowned engineers of Chrysler Corporation designed the Chrysler 300. America's highest performance automobile. Even by 1950 standards, the Chrysler 300 was a big car, almost 18 and a half feet long, weighing over 4,000 pounds. But the Chrysler 300 wasn't just a two-ton tank with a monster motor, it had style. From the very start, Chrysler knew this car had to be special in every way, which meant it had to handle better. It had to have special equipment and options and it had to have a look like no other car. In short, the car had to have image, the essential muscle car ingredient. Chrysler 300 restorers today give most of the credit for this magnificent car to one man's vision, Chrysler's chief engineer, Bob Roger. Bob Rogers were, was a very innovative gentleman. Styling and the idea of performance was his forte. He was a wonderful engineer, and as you can see when you see the new Chrysler 300 commercials, he was an extremely articulate spokesman. Uh, he, he knew how to sell a program. In reality, the 300 was the first factory hot rod, with one basic difference. Hot rods were bare bones, noisy, shade tree engineered contraptions. The Chrysler 300 was a Chrysler, the one characteristic that Hot Rods and Chrysler 300 shared was high performance. It would take a lot of horsepower to make a hot rod out of a car this big. No problem here, the Chrysler 300 had the Hemi. If you nail it on the street, you know, you open up both carburetors and um, it just moves out. It'll shift out of first gear somewhere around between 35 and 40 miles an hour and it shifts out of second gear up around 80 and it just keeps on going. Developed just four years earlier, the Chrysler Hemihead engine was America's most sophisticated high-performance power plant. By 1955, it was making almost one horsepower per cubic inch, which put it right alongside the most powerful racing engines in the world. Hemis had powered Le Mans racing efforts from millionaire sportsman and car builder Briggs Cunningham, and had even shown up inside Indy racers. By 1955, it was America's most powerful engine, the Chrysler 300 was built around it. With this power plant, Chrysler could make a car that gave you the same thrills as a flat-out street rod, without sacrificing any of Chrysler's legendary comfort and luxury. And that's a win-win. Hey, this was the 50s. Anything was possible. Stay with us as Chrysler starts exploring all the possibilities on the American muscle car. Three things happened simultaneously to make the Chrysler 300 a reality. First, there was the development of the Hemi engine. Second was Chrysler's 1955 restyling. 
The third, and probably the most important, was the call from Chrysler lovers all over America to give them a car that had the flash and dash of Detroit's new sporty cars, the Corvette and the Thunderbird. The mission for this car was more to pump some life into Chrysler than to respond to Corvette and Thunderbird. For decades, comfort and luxury had been Chrysler's trademark, not sexy styling and racy engines. But there were a few folks inside Chrysler who thought that performance was the most important part of a car. As far as they were concerned, nothing beat the feeling of letting it all hang out in a finely tuned car. It was these people who went to work on the 1955 Chrysler C300. Chrysler had just spent a hundred million dollars to restyle its entire car line for 1955, and the new Chryslers were vastly different from the 54s. Replacing their old man's car look with styling that was fresh and exciting, the 55 Chrysler Windsor two-door hardtop made an excellent platform for the C300. The 1955 Windsor used chrome trim sparingly, just one single long spear down the side of the car, and the slightest suggestion of chrome fins above each tail light. The most distinctive styling move was the use of the Chrysler Imperial split grille on the Windsor body, making this car immediately recognizable as a C300. Chrysler commissioned a special set of Kelsey Hayes wire wheels for the C300, and on the nose and tail of each car was a checkered flag emblem with a number 300. The only other ID on the car was a small chrome Chrysler 300 on the car's flanks. The C300's insides were Chrysler plush all the way. The standard 50s goodies were there, like power steering, the power flight two-speed automatic transmission, and a padded dash. In typical Chrysler style, there was class at your fingertips but now there was thunder under your foot. The 180 horse Chrysler Firepower V8 developed in 1951 was Chrysler's first V8 engine. Over the past four years, it had been developed into a 300 horsepower high performance engine. This 331 cubic inch power plant used a 4.875 inch bore and a 3.625 inch stroke. It made its horsepower with an 8.5 to 1 compression ratio, a solid lifter cam, dual exhausts, and twin Carter WCFB four-barrel carburetors. For 1955, this was a very sophisticated engine. With 300 horses on demand, Chrysler was able to build a C300 as America's most powerful car. In terms of its character, in terms of what it brought to the street, it was very much a muscle car and uh, it was a car that simply captured everybody's fancy in a big way. As an experiment, the C300 was a success. With new styling and Hemi power, the 300 was the most exciting new car of 1955. But as a sales leader, it didn't set the world on fire. Only 1,725 cars rolled off the assembly line that year. But there was something else going on that year that had race fans all over America buzzing, stock car racing. This sport was gaining momentum, and the fender-to-fender -fender duels between drivers like Buck Baker, Fireball Roberts, Lee Petty, and Tim Flock were packing them in at tracks all over the country. With all that Hemi horsepower on tap, the Chrysler 300 was about to shake up the racing world. Stay with us as the great white sharks from Chrysler are sighted on Daytona Beach when the American muscle car returns. This was NASCAR racing in the fabulous 50s. No silk scarves, no wine and cheese in the pits, just big cars and big guys going flat out. For most racing fans, watching cars they could buy off the showroom floor duke it out on country fair dirt tracks and on the beach at Daytona was the most exciting stuff they had ever seen. New stars were emerging every week, but in 1955, two names stood out above all the rest. Tim Flock and the Chrysler 300. Tim's daughter Peggy became his biggest fan at a very young age. I had my dad as a superhero person, and this was just his magnificent machine. And um, 
I knew that my father could get in that car and he could do anything that he needed to do and that it was going to take him to the finish line with that checker flag. There was just no doubt in my mind. Uh, and I thought my father just looked absolutely awesome behind the wheel of that car. By 1955, Tim had already won the NASCAR championship once, racing Oldsmobiles and Hudsons, and was one of the brightest stars in the young sport. He had attracted the attention of Carl Kiekhaver, the president of Mercury Marine Outboard Motors. Kiekhaver was a certified racing nut and was pouring big bucks into a super team to go stock car racing in 1955. He had chosen the new Chrysler 300 as his race car, and to drive it, he chose Tim Flock. Tim seen that car and he just absolutely had a fit. He said, Tim said the, the sand was actually shivering on that uh, beach because of that Hemi engine. And Tim uh, was talking to this guy, these guys and he said, oh God, if I had that car, I'd win the race today. The gentleman behind him said, uh, who are you? And he said, I'm Tim Flock. He said, come go with me. And he took him and introduced him to Carl Kikafer. And he said, uh, sit down here, boy. And uh, he said, how does that seat feel? And Tim said, he knew just a minute. He said, uh, uh, how does that feet, seat feel? It, it was his ride. Tim Flock did win the race that day, and from that point, he and the big Chryslers never looked back. Flock won 18 races and the NASCAR championship in 1955 in the Kikafer Chryslers, and two legends were born. Tim Flock as one of the greatest race drivers in history, and the Chrysler 300 as the first factory-backed NASCAR race car. Chrysler's 1955 racing experience found its way into the next 300 model, the 1956 300B. Except for the addition of some minor trim and tail fin changes, the 300B was a visual clone of the 55 models. Racing had shown Chrysler one important thing. When it came to engine power, you could never have enough. So the Hemi was bored out to 354 cubic inches and the compression ratio was raised to nine to one. A forged steel crankshaft helped keep everything together, and thanks to the race teams, there was even a new set of 10 to one compression cylinder heads, which produced 355 horsepower. 1956 would be the 300's last year in stock car racing. After winning the first three races that year, including the Daytona Beach race again, Tim Flock left the Mercury team. And at the end of the season, Carl Kiekhaver packed it in. In two years, his rolling billboards for Mercury Outboards had won four times more races than their nearest competitor. In 1957, the 300C would run over 145 miles per hour at Chrysler's Proving Grounds. But the Kikaver Chryslers would never again race on the NASCAR tracks. But that didn't mean Chrysler was done with this car. Stay with us as the Chrysler 300 sets new standards for speed and style on the American muscle car. The 1957 debut of Chrysler Corporation's forward look, created by their chief designer, Virgil Exner, was the styling high water mark of the 50s. Some found these futuristic designs a little over the top. But on the 300, with its cool style and minimal chrome, it looked fantastic. The 57 300C was the most striking car Chrysler had ever made. This car had a look that would stop traffic. Once again, Chrysler went to the well and found more horsepower inside the Hemi engine. It now measured 392 cubic inches and produced an awesome 375 horsepower in street trim. This bad boy would now run 0 to 60 in 8.4 seconds. With this kind of speed, you could run down a Corvette. Thanks to this performance and its serious price tag of nearly $5,200, the 300 earned the nickname, the Banker's Hot Rod. A lot of people consider it a Banker's Hot Rod. It's a driver's car. It's beautifully appointed, so it's like a luxury car, but it also has the muscle and the guts and the go, and it makes it a real driver's car. And that's why they call it the Beautiful Beast. Hey, bankers have the need for speed, too. And with this kind of horsepower, you could be a pretty rapid bean counter. 
the Hemi was still the most powerful American V8 by a large margin. Unfortunately, it was also America's most expensive engine and one of the most complicated to manufacture and service. So in 1959, Chrysler made a historic decision to drop the Hemi in favor of a new 413 cubic inch wedge head motor. Among 300 owners, this was not the most popular decision ever made. The Hemi engine was expensive. It was always expensive and you could do a wedge combustion chamber for less money. I always felt that it was a retrograde step. I always missed the Hemi. The 413 wedge didn't have the Hemi's exotic image, but it was a primo horsepower maker. With a forged crank and rods, hydraulic lifters, and the same 10 to 1 compression ratio, this new engine made 380 horsepower. Thanks to the extra cubic inches, the 413 wedge actually produced more torque than the Hemi, and it made this horsepower and torque at lower RPMs. 1959 300Es were distinctive for a number of other touches, like the flag red grill treatment and the in-your-face 300 numerals on the hood. By 1960, the 300 was still one of the world's fastest production cars, with both a 375 horsepower and a wild 400 horse special version of the 413. But by this time, most of the car's racing heritage had been forgotten. Instead, Chrysler cranked up the styling even more. The 300F for 1960 was as heart-stopping as any of the letter cars which came before it. The all-new unit construction body sported sexy new canted tail fins and a wild-looking Continental kit deck lid. Although the bumpers were getting a little massive, the 300F still used minimal side chrome and other gigaws. Continuing their popular design, which by now had been copied by other personal luxury cars, the 300F's interior was laid out in a four-bucket seat design. The cockpit now resembled a large jet airliner more than a fighter plane. Inside, there was new living leather upholstery and swivel bucket seats. If you checked every box on the 300E's option list, you loaded the car down with 24 comfort and luxury options and inflated the car's $5,318 base price by another $2,400. There's nothing like it anymore in the marketplace. The styling is just nowhere near what it used to be. And the young people look at it and they say, wow, that's a beautiful car. But time was marching on, and 1961 was going to be a watershed year in American car design. Stay with us as the Chrysler 300 collides with the swinging 60s on the American muscle car. Everything was getting smaller and more conservative in 1961, except the Chrysler 300. A front and rear restyle updated the 300G's appearance, but the main things, luxury and top-end speed, were still right there. Nobody minded that the fake Continental kit was gone, but to the disappointment of many, 1961 was the first year since the car's introduction that the new model was slower than the one before. No matter, though, the 413 Cross Ram could still leave a Caddy or a Continental in its dust, and that's the kind of cars the 300 ran with anyway. By now, Chrysler had been selling luxury and speed in one big expensive package for seven years, and the world was changing. A new kind of car enthusiast was in the showrooms now, and he wasn't looking for two tons of sheet metal on wheels, no matter how fast it went. It had been six years since the factory Chryslers had raced on the NASCAR tracks, and the letter cars for 62 weren't going to reverse this trend. In addition, this year for the first time, Chrysler had extended the 300 trademark to its entire line of sports hardtops. They still reserved the letter designation for the real thing, but still, with this marketing move, some enthusiasts felt that Chrysler had taken some of the specialness out of the car. Now, rather than leading the pack into the first turn at Daytona, the 63 and 64 Chrysler 300s led the T-Birds and Eldorados around the country club parking lot. Not that this car wouldn't still win a burnout contest hands down, though. The 413's 390 horsepower would still melt them right down to the rims whenever you felt like it. But the handwriting was on the wall for America's first sports luxury car. 
the 1965 300L was the end of the line for this incredible mark, which had established a new standard of performance and flushness for the entire auto industry. The uh, 65, of course, was already uh, the era when the uh, GTO and the GTXs and the Roadrunners and all that came out, so it kind of did these in. And these became more of a personal luxury car, much like the Thunderbird or Buick Riviera in that realm, with a little more horsepower. This is the next letter in Chrysler's alphabet, the 300M. It's proof that same spirit of performance and luxury still exists inside Chrysler today. The new one has a completely computerized, uh, uh, squeezing out more horsepower per cubic inch, you might say. Uh, it's a V6 in the 300M, uh, and yet it's uh, quite a fast mover. We had them on the track a few meets ago, and the 300M beat everything out except one 300 Hurst. And it did without any screaming or any kind of fanfare. It just moved along. The 300M carries on the spirit of innovation that Bob Roger, Virgil Exner, and others brought to Chrysler Corporation. And there are a lot of letters left for Chrysler to play with. The new Chrysler 300 design will hit the road with rear wheel drive and power from an all new Hemi engine. With new millennium technology and this kind of styling, the years after 2000 are going to be good ones for people who want to go fast and look cool while they're doing it. I think that what they saw in the 300 was an attempt to do what the Viper did a few years ago, was when there wasn't a whole lot going on at Chrysler to come out with a story, something that people would pick up and talk about, and it turned out that the 300 was perfect. The Chrysler 300 letter cars were built around the revolutionary concept that a car's entire reason for being was going fast and looking cool. For 10 years, they were the gentleman's hot rod, and today it's still the same. Whether you're driving a new or a classic 300, the car still looks like money in the bank, and money in the bank is a pretty good thing. Thanks for watching the American Muscle Car, and remember, don't crush them, restore them.